These are the different levels of a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. The general wildlife rehabilitator, that's me. We take everything. You take every species, every class. We don't turn anything away. If you do that in Philadelphia, you will have about 12,000 animals by the end of the day. <laughs> you need to have the ability to get instant knowledge. You have to have the resources to learn something really quick because you're going to get in animals that you've never seen before. You have to have the resources to know what, by the time it gets in the door, how to take care of it, what to feed it, what kind of medical attention it needs. Is there anything weird about the species? Is it endangered? Do you have to report it? If you're going to be a general, it can get really complicated sometimes. You need to have a large assortment of supplies ready. If you only do baby bunnies, you only have to have baby bunny milk, baby bunny syringes, little aquariums, little containers. You don't have to have bird cages, flight cages, mice, rats, meat in your freezer. You do everything, you need a large assortment of supplies because you never know what's coming in your door. It's best if you're in a rural area. If you're in a suburban area, specialize because you will get overwhelmed real quick. A species class rehabilitator. In Pennsylvania, they break up the classes in three different areas. You have your mammals, you have, and then your birds are split into two. Your raptors and your non-raptors. Your raptors are your hawks, falcons, owls, and eagles, and vultures. Every other thing that has feathers is a non-raptor. If you decide, I only want to do robins, the tests are based on this. In Pennsylvania, if you go to take your tests to get licensed, there is a test on mammals, there is a test on raptors, and there is a test on non-raptors. If you only want to do robins, you still better know ducks because it's on the test. The tests are broken down into these three areas. You have to study the whole area. If you only want to do squirrels, you still have to know mammals to pass the test. You can choose to specialize. In mammals, you can become an RVS rehabilitator. I know a rehabilitator who only does RVS and nothing else. She loves it. She can deal with the stress. She just happens to, she loves raccoons. That's how it started. There are rehabilitators that do mammals and all they do is non-RVS. <coughs> RVS is a special, you have to sit through a special class and have special caging to be able to take the rabies vector species. You have to go through some additional stuff, not testing, but you have to go through a few other requirements to be able to take in RVS animals. And that is your choice. You don't want to do them? You don't have to. See, that's the cool part. You don't have to take anything. You do have that power. You have the power to choose what you will do. You could also do backyard mammals. I have rehabilitators that all they do are the common species of cottontail rabbits, your squirrel families, which is your reds, your grays, and your flying squirrels, and she does opossums. That's all she does. That's all she wants to do. Birds, you can choose just to do raptors. And raptors, you can break down into with or without doing eagles. Your non-raptors can get broken down lots of different ways. You have your waterfowl. And I, I have a friend of mine who just does ducks, nothing else. And she'll only do baby ducks. She won't do an injured adult. And it's because of her housing. She doesn't have room for adults. She doesn't have room for anything to fly, but she damn well can take good care of baby ducks. And she does a great job and that's all she does. There's a rehabilitator down in Chester County, just does songbirds. There's another one in New York, just does songbirds. And she's really good at it. She specializes, that's what she loves, and everything is set up just for that. You call her with a squirrel, she's giving you another number. She is licensed just for non-raptor birds. You could do common backyard birds. You could just do the robins and the, the common stuff and not take in the really odd, weird animals that take special knowledge, like chimney swifts. You could become a specialist in a species. There is a lady in New Jersey that just does bats. There's a lady in Kentucky who just does hummingbirds and nothing else. You can do intense species, species that take a lot of time and a lot of energy, like chimney swifts. They're gonna be fed every 10 minutes. Oh, wow. If you have someone else feed them, they will start to go downhill because they get so used to 
your hand comes in just so. You put just this amount onto the thing and they get used to that. You change it, they die. They're intense species. You're not gonna be doing them in November though. You're only gonna be doing them in May and June. This is how you make decisions. Killdeer. These are precocial birds, they feed themselves. Like a duck, like a chicken, sounds like it would be easy, right? You can't get them to eat in captivity. You gotta, you gotta tube feed them. These guys just stress out. You have to get feather dusters and put them around so they can hide under them. And these are an intense species. I've had rehabilitators do these and go, I can't believe how much time and energy I put into it. They were successful. Too much work, too much time, too much money. You could just decide to do common species like we talked about, like the bunnies and the squirrels. So how do you make up your mind? First of all, why are you here? Why did you come today? Why are you interested in wildlife rehabilitation? Where lies your passion? And also, in thinking that, I have one other question. Where lies your fear? You may love owls, but when you have an owl sitting looking at you, clicking its beak, and you know that that great horned owl is packing 1,500 pounds of pressure per square inch in those talons, are you gonna hesitate and be afraid to grab that bird? So, where lies your passion and where lies your fear? What can you handle? Figure that out and then do this. Look at the housing requirements that animal needs. Look at its diet, how much it's gonna cost, the time investment and the handling needed, and that's the fear part, and see if it fits into your life. Housing outdoors. First thing you have to do, contact zoning. Wherever you live, make sure that you are allowed to have wild animals on your property. You will need to know this. You will need a letter from them to send with your permit application. If you don't have one, you don't get it. And all they have to do is say it's not prohibited. If you wanna do raptors, make sure you are allowed to build flight pens outside, that it's not against your zoning. Gilfooses, wonderful people up in Danville. He's a doctor. They live in an upscale community. They're, they're down to earth good people, but their neighbors, they didn't want these in the backyard. They decided that they're not gonna do birds of prey because look it, they need big areas. If you wanna rehab squirrels, you can't just do them in an aquarium and then take them outside and let them run up a tree. There needs to be a transition. You need outdoor caging. Ours is like four by eight by eight for the squirrels. This is not Gilfus's home because I don't have pictures of their home or their flight cage. This reflects conversation I had with them about a flight cage for their songbirds. When they have these beautiful homes around them and people that don't quite understand that they like to save baby robins and, and things and they are licensed. So they had to figure out how to put up a flight cage. Oh, that's smart. But they don't do anything big. They limit what they do according to what they are allowed to have. But isn't that cool? That was the idea. We have what we call our forest room. It is a bedroom that we turned into a flight cage. And it's an intermediary for the animals being inside and flying and going into an outdoor flight cage and flying. And it works. We can keep an eye on them. Baby bunnies, however, this is how big they are when they're released. They can go from the aquarium to underneath your shed. They are only about four and a half, five inches long when you release them. They do not need a transition outdoor pen. If you put them in an outdoor pen, probably a rat will come in and eat them because you've trapped them for whatever predator wants to eat them. So these guys also don't need a lot of supplies. I would love to have all of you turn into rabbit rehabilitators. You know why? There were 1,400 animals that we did last year. I think like four or 500 of them were bunnies. <laughs> so... <laughs> They don't take a lot of food. You can feed them dandelion and broadleaf clover and broadleafs from your own garden as long as you don't use chemicals. There is a downside to doing these guys though. Most of them don't live. Um, they're one of the hardest animals to rehabilitate. You need to have a place indoors. You need a dedicated area. I don't care if it's a bedroom, a garage, a shed, as long as it's appropriate. You can't rehab animals on your kitchen table. You can't do it. It has to be a dedicated area. No pets allowed in that area. No children. If you have little kids, this is not part of their life. They can experience it. They can witness it. 
But unless you have one blossom into like a like a St. Francis of Assisi kind of person, don't demand that they do it. It might not be good for them and it might not be good for the animals, especially young ch children. They need to be kept at distance. But you can do it. You can do it out of a bedroom. And you can do it well. You don't need a big fancy place. You don't. You need a basement. You need a garage. If you have a separate entrance for the public that you can set up a little desk where you can do the intake, get their information, and, and a jar there for donations, you will make more money. If you have them coming into your kitchen or bedroom, you're not going to make a darn thing because they're not going to give money to that. So if you can make it dedicated and have the public see it's dedicated, you will get more in donations. Diet. You cannot go to the grocery store and buy falcon food. You can't go to the grocery store and buy squirrel food. Squirrel food that's sold in the, in the store, at the pet stores, is not nutritionally complete. You cannot go to the store and buy wild bird food. It is like potato chips. It is meant for birds that are out flying free and you are giving them a little treat to supplement all the insects that they are eating all the other times. You can't go to the grocery store and buy diets for wild animals. This is my refrigerator over at Red Creek. Yes, we have lots of fruits and veggies in the bottom, but you see that big bin there? 20,000 mealworms. We go through about 80,000 mealworms a year. We get them by the tens of thousands. We have a guy down in Harrisburg that delivers them at a really cheap price. I, I know you're happy mealworms, but I know you're dying to break in here and tell your story. Oh, real quick. When I first met that, I, okay. I came up one weekend night. It had to be a Friday, Friday night after work, and it must have been 11, 12 o'clock at night. I'm in, a, I'm in a suit, a tie. I, I, was, in, was, a suit. I was in a financial <laughs> services field. So I'm, I'm bushed, it's an hour and three quarter drive, I'm up here, I'm starving, I haven't eaten anything, I'm on appointments. I come in and she's asleep. And one thing you don't do is for no reason whatsoever wake Peggy up when she's asleep unless there's a damn good reason. So anyway, I figure, okay, I'll get myself something to eat. I open up the refrigerator, there's like nothing in there, okay, except there's this little styrofoam cup, like you get to take home food from a restaurant, a styrofoam box. I open it up. It looks like Spanish rice, you know, like rice aroni or something. Oh, great. Oh. I take it, I sit it next to the microwave. I go get my tie off, get my suit off, you know, get a little comfortable, roll up my sleeves. I come back, set the microwave on like a minute and a half, level oh. seven or something. I open, up the mic I open up the microwave, go to put this thing in, and I take a quick look at it. It's moving. I was at, at the I moment, really at the moment I was about to put them in the microwave, just before doing it, I looked at it. And I said, the whole thing was this moving mass of stuff. And I said, oh boy. <laughs> Probably no, you didn't say, oh bit. boy, you went, <laughs> <laughs> and woke me up. That is our freezer. We've had people volunteer for us that could not get past this. If you want to do birds of prey, you got to live with rats and mice. They don't eat hot dogs. They don't eat hamburger. They don't eat steak. They need to eat whole animals. And sometimes, you have to skin them and cut them apart for them. And it's not just your birds of prey. All of your predators need to eat whole animals. You don't feed them whole animals, they will turn out looking like the crow that I showed you earlier. This tiny little weasel. This is an ermine. Oh my god, its eyes aren't even open. Do you know they eat meat and kill before their eyes even open their mother brings them injured mice in for them to decimate look at him going to town on a mouse that i skinned and microtoned microtone means you take your cuticle scissors and you cut it up into these little slivers they need to eat the liver and the brains and the eyes you know how cats need taurine you know where taurine is found in the body in the eyes they need to eat the eyes well, you need to buy them they can get very expensive. Uh, mice are about mm, 75 to $1.50 a piece. They're, it's hard to find inexpensive way to get this food. Rats, buck 50 to 250 a piece. We feed about 20 rats and about 50 mice a day. Do the math. That gets expensive. If you can't find a good place to buy them, then you need to breed them, which means you need to euthanize them.
Can you do that? If you can't deal with that, do vegetarians. You can also pick up roadkill. I, you know, I was showing you guys such bad pictures. I was going to put a picture up there of an actual roadkill. I'm like, you know, I might put them over the edge. I think I'll show them a live squirrel. You can pick up roadkills. We have fed them to... Hmm? You can get diseases and parasites. You can. You can pick them up. You have to be very careful that what you're feeding is healthy and nutritious. But there were years I got by on roadkills. You know, when, when we lost our rodent supply the one year, and I started breeding them until we got on the program we're on now, we would go on roadkill run. Oh my. Honest to God, I wrote a song about it. Remember that? Uh, now wait. Now wait. You want to hear? Tie yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. I got to rehab on a dime because I have very little money, not much time. Caring for these critters, I do not get paid a fee. So I beg and borrow what I can and get supplies for free. Anything that's cheap. I'm driving around for roadkills lying in the street. We have hawks and owls that we need to feed. I have rubber gloves and baggies underneath the seat. If it doesn't smell bad, it goes in the bag hole. Animal delicacies. And a vulture gets whatever isn't maggot free. And there's three other verses. Oh All right. <laughs> Thank you. Songbirds don't eat seed. They also don't eat night crawlers. If you think you're going to get away with fishing worms, uh-uh. They actually will get them sick. They eat a lot of fruits and veggies. See this right here? See this container right here? Insects, which we get by the thousands or tens of thousands. The one day somebody didn't close the live cricket box. Did you know that when crickets escape in mass, they stay along the baseboard until they get to a wall, then they climb up the corner of the wall until they can't climb any higher and then they continue along the baseboard? I know this. <laughs> I also know they sweep up with a vacuum real easy. <laughs> Live is better. But if you can't deal with that, they do sell dehydrated ones at pet stores, but honest to God, it is very expensive to buy it this way. But you can, on the internet, get it in bulk. If you raise songbirds, they eat insects. Even your seed eaters, your sparrows, when the parents are looking for food to feed their growing babies, they need protein and they get it from insects. If you must have a vegetarian because you cannot deal with the rats, the mice, the roadkill, the insects, do these guys. Yes, you can raise a baby skunk on canned dog food, but when you release it, he is gonna get killed by the first dog that he walks up to because he went after his bull outside his doghouse. Same as that opossum. They need to get what's in the wild. Hummingbirds seem like they're easy, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> These are intense species. These are intense species. They have to be fed every 10 minutes when they're babies. But they eat nectar and you can get the nectar. So this is one bird that you actually can feed just a prepared diet to. It can be expensive though. One little pint of powder, this is not your red sugar water you find in the store. This costs $90 for a, one pint of the powder. It costs $90 because it is very special food. We've had a lot of success with it. Plus, we put bananas in there so we get lots of little fruit flies because they do eat insects. And they will eat the fruit flies in there. This is what else you have to deal with. You have to deal with cost. It costs a lot to rehabilitate an animal. You have special foods you have to get. You have to have medications. You might work with a vet that might give you medications. We get a lot of medications free, especially expired drugs from veterinarians. But your veterinary expenses, you need to develop a relationship with your veterinarian. Hopefully, they will do stuff gratis. Some will, some won't. Travel expenses. If you're out picking up animals, it can cost you in gas. Maybe a vehicle, if you put too many miles on it. Your electric bills. Our electric bill is $300 a month over here. And that's all because of the wildlife. We're running freezers. We're running baby incubators. And the hot water is getting run constantly. There are companies out there that make zoological milk formula. One of the better ones is called Fox Valley. We get squirrel milk. We get white-tailed deer fawn milk. We get opossum milk. 
we get cottontail bunny milk, Which you get fox milk. milk. Some of them come in two formulas for the younger ones and the older yeah, ones. A single fawn, when you figure in the cost of the milk it takes for these guys, plus running to the grocery store every two days and stocking the freezer up with fruits and veggies, the medical cost, the vaccines, a single fawn costs us about $600 to raise. We have mama deer, I'm not even gonna include what it costs to keep her a year, but right there's $1,200 in babies. And nothing ever comes in ones or twos. Mama Deer is such a godsend. She mothers all those babies, but she herself was never bred, so she doesn't have milk. So we do have to bottle feed them, but she does everything else, including lick their butts. I love that. None of that money matters. When one of the babies that you released this summer, all of a sudden, three months later, comes back, and there it is. It made it. The goal is for them to survive in the long term. This one survived three months. Will it make it through hunting? I don't know. But the real success is knowing that they make it to adulthood and breed for themselves. This is a female doe that we released three years ago. You know what's coming. Two years ago, she had triplets. Yes! She comes back and visits Mama Deer every day. We catch her on the trail cams. Watch her move. Ooh, there's another picture. Last summer, she had triplets. When we released the fawns, we found out she is also a blessing. She picked them all up. She had 15 fawns with her. <laughs> we were ecstatic. Once Mama Deer finished raising them in the pen, we let them go. This adult doe picked them up and started teaching them how to be wild. Tell me that that's not success. I saw that. You think I thought of $20,000? Bear this thing from my mind. That is what wildlife rehabilitation is all about. Time. This is the typical baby season. It usually starts in April, although lately it's been March and it goes through September, but it can be broken down. And this is when you spend almost all of your time rehabbing. The hot time is May and June. If your family takes a vacation, Memorial Day weekend every year, you better have somebody to take over for you. That's the hottest weekend of the year. This is when you really need to be available. And I'm telling you, you really can't take vacations. You can't plan around anything because you're living, breathing wildlife rehab during this time, unless you've got a network of people. You can choose different species according <laughs> to your availability. Squirrels, They're, you never see a baby squirrel in May or June. If you're not available in May or June, think squirrels, because they're born early. They're born in February and March, and you'll be rehabilitating them mostly in March and April. By May, you're letting them go, and you won't see another squirrel again until they nest twice a year. July, they start coming in again, and we go, oh my God, the squirrels are back. And it's heavy in August and September, but then there's a really good chance you probably will have to keep those babies outdoors over the winter because they won't have a food supply unless they're released at an area where people will put food out for them all winter. But this is how you think about it. What you do is you learn how that species lives, when those babies are, and compare it to your life and what you can do. Baby birds, forget May and June, that's when most of them come in, although they have been starting earlier. So plan on April, July, and August being like a smattering of them. May and June, if you do songbirds, expect to be feeding them constantly because these guys need to be fed like every 20 minutes. Bunnies and opossums, March to September, you never know when they're gonna come in. Baby animals, how often do they have to be fed? Think about this, if you work a job and you have to leave for work and you don't get home for eight or nine hours, and then you've got eight or nine hours in the evening and then you go to bed and you're not the kind of person who can get up during the night, don't feed baby mammals. These guys have to be fed every four hours around the clock. The little itty bitty bitty ones, two to two and a half hours around the clock, okay? Although you can get away with four hour feedings around the clock and during the day catch up with the two to two and a half hour feedings. So I have known rehabilitators that by the middle of baby season, they've got these black circles under their eyes and stuff like that. And my answer to that is you don't have a network of people helping you. You need people helping you. You cannot do this yourself. Songbirds, every 20 minutes. But you're lucky, 
because it's only from sunup to sundown. So it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Bunnies, two to three times a day. They get done every eight hours. Only for the first couple days, then it goes to twice a day. They actually get fed large amounts less often. And because that's how they eat in the wild. The mom usually only feeds them once or twice in 24 hours. But you're never gonna get in two. We had 85 at one time. But if you do baby songbirds and mammals, think about it. <laughs> and you're not just going to get a litter of baby squirrels in or two. We, the one summer, had baby squirrels. We had, I think it was like 60-some baby squirrels. By the time you got done feeding the last one, the four hours had passed, it was time to start with the first one again. There are things you can do to help with the time. How to intubate a skunk. First thing you do is pre-measure the amount that you're gonna feed. We're feeding 8% of its body weight because this little guy is almost of weaning age. One of the things we do is we tube feed animals. It goes quick, guess what? It's hands off. There's no nurturing. Thusly and you do not put your fingers around their neck. You don't want to choke the little guys. You have uh, your thumb near the jawline, this finger supporting the lower jaw. The rest of your hand is supporting their body. This little finger up here goes along the top of their head and that keeps their head in the right position. So if they squirm, their head doesn't move in a position that's gonna make you hit the lungs. Using a five French tube we pull back get the tube in over the tongue and wiggle it up oh, now he's gonna squirm now you see why we need that finger on the top it's okay there we go keep the tube away from their front paws so they don't go yanking it out and you very slowly Give the full amount that you measured. And then very slowly put out the pull out the tube. Don't yank it. And you've got a skunk with a very, very happy tummy. See this right here? That is milk subcutaneous underneath the skin because someone intubated the bunny wrong poked the tube through its esophagus and then gave it milk and it filled up the pouch and that bunny is now dead. It's not dead yet, but it will die of a horrible infection, a systemic infection. It needs to be immediately put down. If you're gonna do bunnies, and this is the other bad thing about bunnies, you can sit and bottle feed them. You can sit and syringe feed them. You will most likely fail at raising them. If you learn to tube feed them, you will have a much higher success rate. But keep in mind, every once in a while, I don't care how long you've been doing it or how good you are, you will kill one. So you decide to do squirrels and baby bunnies, and the squirrels have to be fed at 8, 12, 4, 8, 12, 4. Rabbits have to be fed 9, 9. Baby songbirds, every time you walk by them, and at the same time, the phone is ringing off the hook. Why do you think people burn out? And when you say, can you bring it to me? They go, I have to bring it to you. And you've got people yelling. You mean you don't care enough about this animal that my cat caught to come rescue it? My taxes pay your salary. You, now you understand why people will burn out and they will quit because they don't know about this. And the idea is that you need to plan ahead.